I can't lie, even though my interest in the WWE and professional wrestling as a whole is probably as low as it has ever, ever been, even that time frame from, let's say, 93 to 96 or so, where it was really, really low, uh, there's still something special to me about Survivor Series. It's always one of those shows that I get a little more amped up about and a little more interested for even if I don't have a whole lot of reason to be. It's just, like I said, it's the old school fan in me, what Survivor Series used to represent, even though I know what Survivor Series has become and how it isn't what it used to be, there's still something special there. And I'm, I know I'm not the only one that feels this. There's still that big feel, you know, even with what the WWE does with shows like Night of Champions and Money in the Bank. It's still, at the end of the day, they know that Survivor Series is one of their big four. And in the grand scheme of things, what some fans maybe don't realize or forget about is that after WrestleMania, the oldest of the big four pay-per-views is not the Royal Rumble, is not SummerSlam. Those came in 1988. It's actually Survivor Series that started in 1987. So you're talking about a show that's been around for almost three whole decades now. And a lot of great moments and exciting things have happened at Survivor Series. Obviously, the debut of The Undertaker in 1990 is one that most certainly ranks right up there, along with the debut of The Gobbledygooker. All in one show, Survivor Series 1990. What a classic. But seriously, the debut of The Elimination Chamber in 2002, uh, the debut of The People's Champ, The Corporate Champ, The Rock, Winning his first WWF title at Survivor Series 1998 at the culmination of that tournament show. A lot of big things that happened at Survivor Series. You go back to three years ago. It was the debut of The Shield. Think about that. Survivor Series 2012. All three members of The Shield have been on the main roster for three years now. Last year at Survivor Series, the debut of Sting. So Survivor Series is one of those shows where, you know, Interesting things, exciting things can happen, and maybe I'm just a little hopeful that something big and something exciting is going to happen this year. I don't know if it's setting up that way. I don't know if we're going to get that big shock or that big surprise or that really big moment, but we could be. Who knows? Now, in terms of my thoughts heading into this show, you know, the first thing I'm trying to piece together is uh, what's actually the match card. I know you've got the two semifinal matches. You've got Ambrose versus Ambrose, excuse me, yeah, Owens versus Ambrose, easy for me to say, Del Rio versus Reigns, and then the winner of those two matches will go on and wrestle for the title at the end of the night, you would assume. You've got a Divas title match. I think we've got Tyler Breeze versus Dolph Ziggler, I think. And I don't know, maybe there's a tag team match somewhere that I'm not thinking of. Uh, but then obviously you've got the Brothers of Destruction taking on the Wyatt family, and that's pretty much the card. And I'm, I, I will say, is, and I always say this every time when it comes to Survivor Series, I really miss the way it used to be, where you would have Survivor Series, you had the traditional four-on-four, four, five-on-five tag matches, you would have four tag teams versus four tag teams, or five tag teams versus five tag teams. That's what I used to really love about Survivor Series. It was the one show of the year that truly felt different compared to anything else. Even the Royal Rumble itself, because while you had the Royal Rumble match, you would have other singles matches, a tag team title match, whatever. But Survivor Series, it was pretty much a show for tag teams. And being a fan, an older fan, a fan of tag team wrestling, I used to love the feel of Survivor Series, and I miss the way it used to be done, and I wish they would actually go back to it, because it would be a way for them to incorporate more people on the roster. And, you know, based off the way, frankly, the WWE writes their shows and books their shows anyways, there's not a whole lot of storyline intrigue heading into it. So just make a bunch of fucking different tag teams and let them fucking go at it. If anything, the Survivor Series show with the old format is perfect for today's product. And I wish the WWE would realize that. But the biggest things to talk about, I guess, the Divas title match. If that's really a big thing to talk about with Paige and Charlotte. You'll probably get a match that will get some time because they'll need this match to fill a little bit of time on this card. Paige will scream and be like every other Diva on the roster. Charlotte will probably win and be close to crying like it seems like she always is. I really don't give a fuck about it. Surely some of you do. I just don't. So there we go. You know, Tyler Breeze, Dolph Ziggler, I couldn't give a fuck less. Uh, any other match that I haven't talked about that's on this show, and I'm, maybe I'm missing one, 
but I don't think there's a traditional Survivor Series tag match, at least at the time of recording this. Maybe I'm wrong, um, but if there is, it would be nice to know about it. It would be nice if this show actually had one, and maybe they'll throw one together at the last minute, because frankly, they should. Uh, we get to the two semifinal matches. You've got Del Rio versus Reigns and Ambrose versus Owens. See, I got it right that time. In terms of Ambrose versus Owens, this is the match where you really don't know where the WWE is going to go. You think that they'll have Ambrose win, so that way it could be him and Reigns in the finals. You might also think, though, that they might want to have a heel face off against Roman Reigns, so to speak, a heel and Kevin Owens, and they might have him advance. You know, a lot of things can happen. Frankly, between the two semifinal matches, I think I'm much more intrigued by the possibilities of what Ambrose versus Owens can bring as opposed to Reigns versus Del Rio, because probably most of us assume we know where Reigns and Del Rio is going. And it's probably true. You know, if they really wanted to make shit interesting, though, and you wanted to incorporate Sheamus, have Sheamus come in and fucking take out Reigns in the semifinal, have Del Rio advance to the final, maybe have Ambrose win, and then fucking have Sheamus cash in on him. Now you got people really pissed off. Because while they might be relieved, a lot of people on the one hand, because Roman Reigns has been forced down your throat so much that in three fucking years he's never held the world title, even though Seth Rollins got an eight-month title reign. Now Dean Ambrose, uh, somebody a lot of people could get behind being the champion, would have gotten there, actually realized the moment, only to have it snatched away by Sheamus. And would give you the platform to do a short-term program between him and Ambrose going to the, through the Royal Rumble. You could set the table still for Roman Reigns to win the Royal Rumble, if that's what they want to do again, and have him go on to face Sheamus at WrestleMania. And while there's always that thought process of that match could be booed out of the fucking building, at the end of the day, that title match not might not mean that much in the grand scheme of WrestleMania 32. It might be the place to have Roman Reigns win the title. Uh, this is still where I wish, especially with the news, apparently, that The Rock could be doubtful or very doubtful to actually work at WrestleMania 32. This is where I still wish they would work in some type of way for Triple H to win the belt. Because at the end of the day, God's going to get himself a big Mania match. We know this to be true. God ain't missing that seven-figure payday for Mania. Especially in front of 105 plus thousand people. So that way Triple H can sit there after WrestleMania 32 when they draw that many people. And he'll sit there and say, I was a guy. A big part of that ugh. In fact, uh, I was maybe the single biggest reason for that. Ugh. You know, that man's ego is magnificent. It happens when you're God. And you have the books of Hunter Hearst and Helmsley that clearly indicate that you have to be on that show because that show can't survive without you. You know, in terms of who wins the tournament, a lot of people would bitch and moan if Reigns wins. A lot of people would probably be happy if Ambrose won. A lot of people would really bitch and moan if Sheamus cashed in and walked out of Survivor Series the champ, especially if he, if he screwed over Ambrose and that's who he cashed in on. I just get this overwhelming sense of no matter what's going to happen with Survivor Series, come the result of this tournament, that it could end up disappointing everyone. I mean, you have three different options, four different options, four different directions you could go. You could just have Reigns win it straight up as a face. Um, which probably would go over like a fart in church, but you know, fuck it. If that's what you're going to do, that's what you're going to do. You could have Roman Reigns win it as a heel, do some type of heel turn where he beats Ambrose in the final and fucking aligns himself with Triple H. Sounds kind of lame to me, and I don't think turning Reigns heel the, is the answer. How about just booking him better as a baby face and you know, giving people reason to actually get behind the guy, making him a somewhat sympathetic figure, you know, actually having him get close, but not actually always achieving the top thing. Uh, you know, it might actually help him get over, especially if people don't feel like he's quite as forced down their throats, have him do some cool, awesome things instead. So there, for those of you that don't think I can go more in depth in another video about how to make Roman Reigns a decent baby face, you know, there's some ideas, okay? Uh, as far as Ambrose winning it, you know, again, you could go with him winning it as a baby face and people will cheer. You probably get a little more shock value out of it if you had him be the one that aligned himself with Triple H and he turned heel and he fucked over Reigns. That probably give everybody a circle jerk of what the fuck just happened. Oh my god, that's awesome! You could have Kevin Owens align himself with um, uh, Triple H and you could have him be the one that wins the belt, wins the strap. You know, and then you've got option five, which is always Sheamus cashing in and being the guy at the end of the night. And maybe that's the way they need to go. Because I'm being honest here with you. For both Reigns or Ambrose, I really don't think this moment in time at this show, Survivor Series, is the right place for either one of them to win the title for the first time. I don't think it'll feel right. I don't think it'll have a big sense of payoff. 
And if we're not going to get a big sense of payoff, at least try to accomplish something. And that is giving us a heel Seamus with the Money in the Bank beef briefcase as monumentally boring as that will fucking be. At least you will be trying to get some heat onto a heel to where he can actually pass it over to an Ambrose or more likely than not a Reigns at WrestleMania 32. And it could potentially work at least a little bit. That's just me, though. And then we get to the match that I really actually care about the most, and that is the Brothers of Destruction taking on the Wyatt family. I really don't care about the Wyatt family, Bray Wyatt and his crew, two plus years, and they're basically in the same fucking spot. Not a lot of interest there for me. I will admit, though, seeing the Brothers of Destruction together in this capacity is pretty cool. It's nice to have that kind of short-term nostalgia pop. It certainly is. Now, obviously, we're celebrating 25 years of The Undertaker, 25 years since his debut at Survivor Series 1990. You know, what would be really awesome, instead of deciding what two members of the Wyatt family will face off against Taker and Kane, would be if we did a four-on-four -four traditional style Survivor Series type of tag match, and you freaking could bring in a Sting here. Imagine if you aligned a Sting with the Brothers of Destruction, and then you need a fourth member, you bring back the gobbledygooker! Let's celebrate 25 years of that son of a bitch! Woo -doo -doo -doo! Woo -doo -doo! Oh, could you imagine that you could bring back Mean Gene and they could do a bunch of fucking square dancing in the center of the ring after the victory? Ha <laughs> Now that's the fucking traditional Survivor Series tag match I could get behind. Um, I find it really hard to believe that the WWE would just send the Wyatt family out to slaughter again in this match. At the same point in time, I find it really hard to believe that you would have Taker and Kane lose, especially since you're putting such big emphasis on Taker... Uh, being with the company for 25 years, 25 an 25th anniversary of his debut at Survivor Series 1990. You know, maybe that's a good reason to put Bray Wyatt over The Undertaker. I just wonder if Kane is ultimately in the match to be the sacrificial lamb and to have Bray Wyatt get the pin. I don't know. I just... It's like a lot of things now that the streak has ended with Undertaker. Believe me, it's, on the one hand, it's really cool to see Taker putting in this much work in 2015. He just doesn't have to. He just doesn't have to, and yet he does. This is, what, his fourth pay-per-view match this year. His fourth pay-per-view match. I mean, mad props and respect to the dude. Almost 50 and fucking doing what he doesn't have to do. And it, it, But at the same point in time, it's like, I don't really see the point. I don't really see the purpose. I don't really see where there's a payoff here. If Taker and Kane win, that's good. But again, what does that really mean for the Wyatt family? And even if the Wyatt family somehow beats the Brothers of Destruction, is there really any follow-up? Is there really any point? Was there really any payoff? You know, so you're going to tell me Bray Wyatt can't even beat Roman Reigns, but now he's going to beat one of the truly all-time greats, arguably the greatest WWE super, superstar of all time, and The Undertaker, the epitome of any ways of the WWE, one of the guys you think of first when you think of WWE, you know, come on now. I mean, so it's kind of one of these things where I think it's going to be emblematic of the entire pay-per-view. Just a bold prediction is I think a lot of shit will go down where, you know, people will be excited about the matches. They'll swoon all over Ambrose and Owens. They'll swoon over the title match, especially if Reigns doesn't win. And maybe that will cause an overreaction where people automatically think it's awesome. But I think both short term and long term, this is a show that's setting up to be disappointing. That's not going to have a lot of payoff. And again, I don't really see where a big surprise is coming. And this is a show that, even more than last year's Survivor Series, really could use that sting type of major surprise. And I just don't see where it's coming. And I just think that come Sunday night, a lot of people are going to be disappointed and kind of have a meh reaction to what happened at Survivor Series 2015.